Okay, so we're going to talk about some channels that we've been finding interesting recently that are maybe doing something fresh, a bit different on YouTube. So yeah, Jamie, who have you who have you got? Yeah, so there's this channel that I saw maybe two weeks ago that just came out of absolutely nowhere and it kept getting recommended on my homepage and it already had like 900k views. And so I thought, well, this is you know a popular channel that's already doing really well, but I thought it had an interesting title and thumbnail. And when I then clicked onto the YouTube channel, I saw that they only had three videos and this video that was being recommended to me that was at 900k was only in three days. And this was a completely fresh YouTube channel. And the other two videos that had been uploaded prior to it were really starting to build up some steam as well because this, this latest video was doing so well. And I, I tweeted about this because I just find it so interesting how these YouTube channels can blow up out of nowhere with, you know, one of the first few videos. And then you have other people who will spend years working on a YouTube channel, not really having the algorithm promote them, uh, not really finding that that sort of market fits that you would need with a brand new YouTube channel for it to blow up instantly. And yeah, I just wanted to spend some time on, on, the, on this podcast, really just talking about why I think that is, hear your thoughts on, on this particular YouTube channel. Um, for those who haven't seen it, it's called Easy Actually. And I find this really interesting because not only because it blew up so quickly, but just because there's like a very simple art style to it. So if you're listening to this episode, I will describe <laughs> what these thumbnails look like. But they have like a very low quality, low effort stick figure drawing. Um, and this is sort of the character of the YouTube uh, of the YouTube channel. And there are all of these other really low quality copy pasted graphics and photos um, on this on this thumbnail. So for example, there is a video called Becoming Smart is Easy Actually. And the thumbnail text says a guide to becoming smart. And there are just these copy and pasted photos of books with a big cross over them of like how these are not books to read. And then the stick figure is holding a stack of books and it looks really low quality and it doesn't look great at all. And there's another stick figure there holding a cardboard sign that says, I have a PhD, right? So a lot of people were freaking out about why this video was uh, blowing up because it, it's basically breaking all of the rules of what we know about thumbnail design, right? Like everyone who makes these thumbnail designs at the moment, and I've, I've tweeted about this before and kind of crit critiqued the thumbnail designers in general because a lot of their skill sets at the moment just lean towards the Mr. Beast style of YouTube, are very close in the thumbnail, really bright white eyes, bright teeth, over the top smiling, pointing at something next to them. And I find that style very boring. And I've said, you know, many times to those thumbnail designers, like, if you want to make more money as within your career as a thumbnail designer, actually try out new styles because there are so many YouTubers that I work with who want a new style that don't want the Mr. Beast style, but they can't find them because all the thumbnail designers are leaning heavily into this. And I saw a number of thumbnail designers hating on this thumbnail concept um, and not liking it. You know, why is it working? It's so ugly. And I think they missed the point of what what the point of a thumbnail actually is. You know, it's not about the design and how good it looks. It's about capturing your attention and making you want to click. And that's what this thumbnail did. And I think this thumbnail did this very well, pairing with that title of Becoming Smart is Easy Actually, all in lowercase. It just feels like a low effort video um, of, of someone who just put this video together. But actually, when you click on it, it's highly edited. And it's edited in a way where you can tell they've put a lot of effort into it, but it's made to look low quality. So it's like they're the, the anti-YouTuber in a way, and they've been very thoughtful and meticulous about how they wanted to, to promote this video. And that's why it's crushing. That's, it's got 2.3 million views right now. And I had some thoughts as to why, why I think this would work, but what, what were your first, first impressions when you, when you saw this, this video? My first thought actually was just, um, it, it looks like the background is black. Um, so it looks a bit like a blackboard that you'd see in school, right? And but it's got these wiggles on it, um, like the, the the stick drawings, and that all looks very amateur. And so that kind of matches with the um, the titles, which is like, hey, it's not all. You don't need to make it over complicated. It can be simple. You can do things in like, like a DIY simple way. Um, and so yeah, the 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 art style fits the message um and and yeah i think one of the inspirations here might be answer in progress especially their trolley problem thumbnail uh, which if you're watching on video we can pull it up but 
for people listening, um, that's just like stick figures um, illustrating the trolley problem of like, if you're on a runaway train, do you pull the lever uh, and the runaway train is going towards five people? Do you pull the lever to move it onto the tracks where there's only one person? Um, or do you like let the train go? Um, and that was really successful for Answer in Progress originally. And Answer in Progress has this similar style where they're like, hey, guys, we're all in this together. Let's figure it out um, in a very kind of irre irreverent kind of um, Gen Z kind of way. So that, that was my first uh, impressions. What about you, George? The first thing that struck me about this, to be honest, was, um, I mean, at least at the time of recording, there's only three videos on this channel. There might be more by the time that this episode is released, but they all seem about very different things. And I suppose more what it brought to mind for me was a question around like what the kind of, uh, who, who the audience for this thing is. And one of you guys just mentioned general, like Gen Z people, which I guess is probably part of the strength of it. But it's like someone who's interested in becoming smart is not necessarily someone who's interested in um you know the trolley problem specifically like this i guess there could be some crossover but i'm just interested in like what this channel sees itself as being long term and where um you know what's off limits or is nothing off limits for this thing is it more about the format itself and less about the kind of subject matter um so i'm curious i don't really have an answer i'm just curious about what the the aim is you know so i think the trolley problem is the least viewed video on there 142k views whereas these a guide to becoming smart is 2.3 and a guide to personality is 500k so i definitely think they need to start leaning more in towards this guides and the thing is he's like everyone wants to be smarter so that appeals to everyone hence it has the most views getting a personality everyone has a personality again that's quite a broad topic i think the trolley problem is obviously quite a niche um thing that a lot of people don't even know what that is right and so that's why I think that the views are a lot lower on that. But I, I think, you know, this kind of brings up the point of familiarity. And I think that's what this, these titles and thumbnails are doing very well, where, you know, that second half of that title is consistent, right? It's like, is um, easy actually. That then makes it very simple for people to recognize that title every single time and just understand that that first half of the title is going to change video to video. Uh, it's the same thing with, with the thumbnail style, it's very similar, but there are these little things that change and that's what makes it unique. And I think that this is like a, a comment really on, on why the best YouTubers have such similar thumbnails, you know, and even if you do go back to someone like Mr. Beast, all of his thumbnails look very similar, right? They have like the same four to five concepts, but everything just changes in the background of that. And I think that's what really helps with that familiarity because if you enjoyed one of these videos, then you're way more likely to click on it again. And this is something that I found quite a lot with, with some of my clients. Um, I actually have a whole YouTube video dedicated to kind of like building up concepts on YouTube channels, because once you hit that product market fit with, with your target audience with a certain style of video, you should find ways to tweak little elements of it, but repeat it time and time again and start to build your audience from there. And one of my clients was this gardening channel, and we come across this concept called sow these seeds in, and the month was what changed, but that so these seeds stayed every single month. And we've done that now for like a, a year and a half that we've worked on this. It was the first video that we ever worked on, it blew up. And every video that we worked on since, it, it blew up. Like they used to get 60,000 views on average, and now they get like 500K to a million with these videos every single time. And it's again, it's because their audience is now trained to look for that style of thumbnail with that text. And so I think like concept channels as a thing are are really cool. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about them a little bit more in depth in, in a moment, but I kind of just want to hear, you, you know, your thoughts on this, Gwilym, because I know you had something you wanted to say about the thumbnails. So what I will say is that I think both of those things have a really interesting kind of hook psychology. Um, so sow these seeds in whenever. I assume if you're publishing the video in January, you're going to say, so these seeds in spring or or like in January, or if, if, if you're doing it in March, it'll be like, so these seeds in spring, right? I'm, I'm guessing that's right. Is it? Well, yeah, it would, it would be the month because the month creates urgency of like, yeah, I need to get these exactly, seeds in right. the end by the end of the month. And then we right. go broader with the title. Exactly. So that's like gardening psychology is that people will be like, oh, there is a limited window of opportunity to watch this video. They have information that I may not have. Um, therefore, I have to click this now. Um, and I think the interesting thing, the psychology of the trolley problem 
is easy actually or getting a personality is easy actually is um you're telling people this thing that maybe you've like struggled with or worried about so like being smart having, having a personality um uh is 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 something that is attainable um and that creates this kind of curiosity gap of like wait is it how in what way um but it's also promising like great rewards right if you can figure out how to become smart in seven minutes 33 seconds uh, I, I know i'm stating the obvious here but a lot of youtubers just don't think about this closely enough and they will maybe go like my complete guide to becoming super smart with a very polished thumbnail of them looking very studious in a library looking very smart and suddenly it's not someone who's in the trenches with you who is like hey man actually i found this kind of cool way it's not that difficult at all but rather it's someone who is preaching to you from on high of like here is how i became smart you may or may not be able to you know depending up upon like um like how capable you are um so yeah i think that's the that's the main thing with this channel is that they are making it seem really doable and they're not it doesn't look preachy yeah so this this kind of brings me onto the idea of concept channels because i think that the the value proposition of this youtube channel is somewhat clear in terms of like that familiarity between all of the videos and you know the next video you can very easily imagine what that thumbnail is going to be just judging on the consistency of these three videos and you pretty much know what the title is going to be and so when that video launches and it, youtube shows it to the subscribers I think it's going to be very easy for them to spot it and go, oh, it's a new video from Easy Actually and Click. And, you know, there, there was a concept um, video that did really well, uh, like a number of years ago. Um, it was called History of the Entire World, I guess, by Bill Wirtz. Uh, 166 million views in six years, which is crazy. And even to this day, it's getting 1.5 thousand, um, so 1.5K views per hour six years later, which is just insane. But it has a very specific thumbnail style and title. And there's been so many spin-offs of this video on YouTube channels. Like there's a YouTube channel called Creator Brain that only has 50,000 subscribers, but it has the entire history of YouTube, I guess. And it has over 800K views. There is a Minecraft YouTube channel that did the entire history of Minecraft, I guess. That's got 37 million views in three years. Going back to Answer in Progress, they've got the entire history of the YouTube algorithm, I guess, as well. Yes, as the yeah, title. Taha did that. Yeah, yeah, and that, that crush, that video did really well at the time. I remember that. And yeah, there's so, so many. If you go into YouTube and you just type the entire history of, you will see so many of them. Like I'm looking at one now. There's a Fortnite YouTube channel that did it. But there's a Premier League one. There's one about bread. And the thing that I thought of was like all of these videos are doing so well on the a youtube channel but i was like what if someone just made an entire youtube channel about just just called the entire history of and each video just swapped in between all of these different topics i think that that would be a really good youtube channel um and you know there was someone who reached out to me before for some advice with like a faceless youtube channel and i don't really know a great deal about faceless youtube channels um but I, I kind of mentioned this to them and I said, you know, and they were thinking about doing Formula One. Their YouTube channel is about Formula One. It wasn't getting much traction. They were like, I'm getting a few thousand views. Why? What, what's wrong? And I, I looked at their content and it was the same as all of these other faceless YouTube channels that are in F1. I was like, you need to differentiate yourself um, because they were just copying their competitors and it, it just wasn't working. Um, and I, I mentioned this whole thing to them and I said, why don't you make one called the entire history of Formula One, I guess and just make a video in that style and see if it does really well. And they procrastinated on it. They, did, they didn't listen to, to, to my advice on that. Um, and then there's this YouTube channel that came out last year um, called Roman Hill. And this guy uploaded his very first video. It was called The Entire History of Formula One, I guess. And it got 1.2 million views. And I was just thinking like, oh my God, I had the idea. Like I told that guy to do it and he didn't do it. And this video blew up. And then he did another one, which was the 2021 Formula One season in under 11 minutes in a very similar style of, of video. And that got 302K views for only his second video. And 
he's done really well there. And so I, I think there is something to be said about these concept channels of like building your entire YouTube channel around an editing style, a thumbnail style, a, a title style that people are familiar with that performs and just expanding from there. You don't have to try and jump on all of these different topics. Um, like we usually see with people when they experiment trying to grow a YouTube channel. Another thought that I had of, of why this channel did so well is that this style of, of thumbnail and concept in the video was done like 10 years ago. I remember watching this stuff when, when I was a teenager and I was thinking this style now probably appeals to teenagers and people in their early 20s, but they probably weren't on YouTube watching this content 10 years ago or even eight years ago. And so as a result, this, and, and this was one of the tweets that I got as a, as a reply to, to mine of like, oh, this seems so fresh and new. And whenever you think YouTube's got stale and a bit boring, all of a sudden someone comes up with this fresh and exciting idea. And I, you know, I responded to them with like three YouTube channels being like, no, look, this is, this is stuff from 10 years ago that is very similar that did so well and got millions and millions of views. And so I think in a way we're kind of coming full circle, kind of like how we do with, with movies, with music. Um, where that younger generation don't know about the stuff that came before it. And so it resonates with them and, and they grow really quickly. And so I'm just thinking, what are these other concepts that are in the past on YouTube from like 2013 that would actually do really well today, but people have just forgotten about? I, I think it, it just, it speaks to that, uh, just the cycles that we see with everything. It, it's, I agree, it's probably partly a certain generation discovering things that they hadn't seen before. But it's also that oversaturation of a particular thing that our brains start to get used to it. And so all of a sudden, when you open YouTube and your homepage is really highly edited uh, thumbnails and the same kind of like explosive titles and blah, 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 suddenly seeing that simplicity and like this little black thumbnail with little stick figures on it, um, naturally that becomes something that sticks out. And then inevitably people will catch on to that and they will extrapolate a lot from that and we'll see more and more of those. And then that'll be you know, not necessarily this exact type thing, but, um, you know, it resaturates then with a different type of style. And then what we had five, 10 years ago becomes unusual. And so then that comes back in. And like you say, Jamie, like it's, you know, with movies and with fashion and music and all of that stuff, it's, um, it's like this kind of cycle of, uh, you know, rejecting the thing that came before to try something new and then circling back eventually. So, Gwilym, uh, do you want to talk us through the channel that you've been looking at this week? Yes. Okay, so this is a bit of a mean nerding out thing. I, I don't know how useful this will be for most viewers, but um, it's, it's a channel called Fallow. Uh, they've got about 350,000 subscribers. They started posting maybe maybe a year and a half ago. And they're a restaurant in London, like a, a kind of standard British cuisine, French cuisine, for international viewers, like... There is some French cuisine in there as well. It's not all British potatoes. Um, and what I love about them is that they clearly do most of their videos. Okay, I, maybe I'm wrong, but they clearly do most of their videos as one take. So like, here are some titles. How to prepare and serve a trout. Um, point of view. Could you hack it as a chef at a top London restaurant? How to cook a pig head. And it's usually... There's one camera that's following the chef around or like just locked on him as he's doing something in the restaurant. And it's got a few kind of key ingredients that make it really compelling. One is that like he clearly knows what he's talking about. Um, and that uh, like, and he's used to teaching people already because I assume he works with a lot of junior chefs. So he's saying stuff he's already said before. Um, but it, this stuff is just being unleashed on camera. Um, uh, the second thing is that it just feels like you're there in the moment. It's very immediate. You can also tell from their their thumbnails are all basically screen grabs from from the uh, the footage. But whoever's filming clearly knows what they're doing because they the shots are always good. It feels raw, but like in a good way. Um, and I just. I get excited whenever I see a channel that has found a formula that works for them, that is very, very uh, authentic to who they are. And that and they're just, they're publishing like, how often? Like, I think at least four, sometimes six, sometimes eight videos a month because they don't have 
they don't feel restricted about what they're talking about they're like I, I, you can tell that they're just like oh we're getting a whole tuna delivered tomorrow let's make a video about that and they just roll um so yeah this 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 channel makes me happy um <laughs> jamie i know you watch it <laughs> I know you watched it a bit as well. What, yeah. what, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been watching this, yeah, for, I don't know, half a year at least. And it, it's a lot of it is for the same reasons that, you, that you've given. I think what's unique about this particular YouTube channel is that it's a guy wearing a GoPro at a high-end restaurant in London. And, you know, most of the cooking videos that you see on YouTube usually are like, here's how to make this recipe. And it's usually some dude who is not a Michelin star chef or a chef in general. It's just some guy who's like Joshua Wiseman. I think he was a chef. He's, he's interesting because you get to see that. But a lot of the other YouTubers who are at the top of their game are like at home cooks who then made videos about food and then have sort of built up a following. And when you think of like traditional cooking programs on TV, Jamie Oliver, Gordon Ramsay, it's either with contestants or it's watching them from afar and it's highly edited or they're teaching you how to cook it doesn't have that same value proposition as this youtube channel does because as you say it's they have this text at the top of all of the thumbnails that say 28 minutes of busy service and it's real time and i find that to be fascinating to watch through the eyes of a top chef at a busy restaurant during service for an extended period of time and seeing what it's actually like how they're doing it and at the same time he's giving his tips on why he's doing certain things you don't get that from TV. You don't get that from a lot of other YouTube channels. And I think that's why this stands out. And, you know, going back to the first YouTube channel that we spoke about of having consistent, um, you know, thumbnails and title styles, as you said, all of these thumbnails look like they're a screen grab from the video. And it's usually with his hands in the shots showing that it's from, uh, you know, GoPro or his point of view. And all of his top videos have that POV, POV, point of view at the start, we're building in that familiarity again. It's like his top video is point of view, head chef at top London restaurant, 5 million views. His second video is point of view, bartender at a top London restaurant, 3.3. And all of them, Pov, head chef at a high end restaurant, 1.6 million views. They're all very similar in terms of that branding, but they all get millions of views because again, there's that familiarity that people love and they know exactly what they're going to get. So I'm a huge fan of this, this YouTube channel and, and how they've managed to grow so quickly. Yeah, I, I think um, if you wanted to expand this to like, how could this be useful for other concepts? It would be, it would be like behind this. It's why day in the life videos work so well. Like day in the life of a maths pr professor at Harvard, or like day in the life of a of like a sports nutritionist at Liverpool Football Club. Like it, it's it's this idea, like you say, Jamie, of just like seeing what the experts actually do. Um. And I think it's because people are aware that, like you said, a lot of their knowledge comes in like a very filtered form by people who are um, who are maybe experts in a way, but they're not actually um, professionals practicing their craft in like a, in, in a real sense. Um, uh, so yeah, I think yeah that that's def that's now that you mention it, clearly one of the reasons I was so interested in this was because. I wanted to see the real stuff. I'm almost 100% sure that these guys have been inspired by a guy called Kenji Lopez Alt, who also does cooking videos. He's a chef, a professional chef, but what he does is he wears his GoPro when he's at home cooking for himself. And I think I watched a lot of his stuff just because it has that same unfiltered professional person doing thing in the way that they would normally do it at home. So yeah. Uh, George, I'm curious, what channel have you been thinking about or that's on your mind that is doing something fresh or different or new? Sure. Yeah, I think actually and it, it ties into what we've spoken about already, particularly with regard to this, like, you know, keeping a very similar format and just kind of replacing a word and blah, 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 uh, and figuring out what your audience expects to see and then delivering on that. Um, but I, I wanted to talk about um, Mike Shake, who's a client of mine or an ex-client of mine who we've spoken about before on the podcast. Um, because I think he he's doing something at the moment that is, again, kind of a trend that we're seeing across YouTube a little bit uh, at the moment. And again, related to the thumbnails we've spoken about today, where he's, he's basically toning everything down and he's kind of simplifying um, the way he does things. 
um, when, when I was working with Mike, it was, uh, you know, like the first video that I worked on with him was a video called How Dangerous is a Whip? And it was basically a video where he learns to crack a whip and then he learns to like destroy increasingly difficult targets ending with his phone. And at the time, like, well, you know, I was working with Mike, uh, you know, we were talking with, um, you know, some strategists and figuring out how to like optimize X, Y, Z and how we can implement music to do this, that and the other. And, and you know, which I think is a temptation for a lot of YouTubers is like, okay, I've, I've kind of found like what my style is. I know what my audience like now, how can I dial this up? How can I increase the production value? How can I blah, blah, blah. Um, and what Mike started doing recently and, and, you know, candidly, the reason we stopped working together was that he, uh, I think realized that he wanted to like feel really connected with his videos and to feel like his personality was really, really coming through in them. And so the last two videos that he's done, a taking that format that I spoke about the how dangerous is a is a whip. He's now done a video called how dangerous is a slingshot very similar thumbnail. And that video has got like 7 million views in the last, uh, you know, couple of weeks, I think last three weeks, maybe. Uh, and then the next one, uh, the video he did it's after 7. that 7. is seven in a month. I'm just looking at 7.7 7 in a month. Okay, cool. And you know, for context, his, he's like 3.4 million subs at the time of recording his videos mostly will kind of do like anywhere between two and five million views um sometimes they'll blow up and do like 10 15 um but yeah like so big outlier and then the second uh, or the most recent video he's done at the time of recording is like building a whip out of uh i can't remember what it's called something like how to build the most dangerous whip in the world or something like that but again it's like it's leveraging the same uh title concept it's leveraging the same thumbnail concept but both of these videos when you watch them and it's like it's quite a uh it, it hits you quite hard if you're already familiar with his content, but suddenly like there's no music and there's no craziness and this kind of like retention obsessed mindset seems to have gone. And you can really, you can feel like his personality in these videos so much more um, than you could even, you know, when I was working with him, because like, you know, when I'm there, I'm taking that personality away and I'm like, I'm writing it in the way that I think uh, would be really useful for retention and blah, blah, blah. But it's like it's not getting to the core of who Mike is, um, and particularly, yeah, removing that music really, really feels like we're just spending time with a guy who is obsessed with this thing and wants to experiment with it and see what comes out. And um, I think that idea of simplifying things is is really interesting uh, at this at this time. Something I'm finding particularly interesting on that topic is is seeing uh, YouTubers. Um copying what was working a few years ago but like because maybe they, they have a bit of an outdated understanding of youtube so like the typical like math i, I for people who are listening i'm opening <laughs> my mouth as wide as it will go and pointing to an imaginary object that kind of mr beast oh face um uh like people do this because and i found even when we were doing the photo shoot for this podcast right I found myself doing that stupid face because I was like, well, that's what like YouTube, that's what we'll need for YouTube thumbnails, right? But again, what we're coming back to for both of these things is like, it's really not try doing something different that shows more personality. But yeah, George, do you reckon these, uh, I'm assuming these videos will have been easier to produce as well? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And it's like, uh, even just the, the feedback loop of not working with a writer and being able to like the way Mike's described it, like we still talk and he, he's saying like, it's, he, I think he was missing. He was missing that creativity that comes with like, uh, you know, I can, I can be there kind of uh, like writing stuff out, changing little bits in the edit here and there. And uh, just, I don't know, being, I think we assume that the goal is to get good at what you're doing with your, your channel and then just start like scaling up and getting more team members in and getting people to help optimize everything. And actually, YouTube at its core should be something that is fun and that is uh, getting to spend time doing something that you love and sharing it with people. And, uh, you know, and I, so this is why I took no offense when he was just like, dude, I just want to start writing my own stuff again. I was like, yeah, that totally makes sense. All this to say, I think the feedback loop being a lot shorter um, and, you know, not having to think so heavily about like, oh, which music are we going to pair with this particular section and uh, to elevate this particular emotion in this way and blah, blah, blah. There's a place for that on YouTube for sure. 
uh, but it doesn't have to be where everyone is aiming for, I suppose, would be the, the takeaway. Mm. I, I think I think there's an extra thing to be taken from this. So we discussed it a little bit with like, should you do a vlog or not in a past episode? But some people and Mike from Mike Shake is 100% in this camp is like, some people have internalized all of the YouTube retention knowledge, they like know when to talk to camera, how to talk to camera, what they should be saying, how you hook a viewer. And so they can go back to basics because their A roll and the way they've thought out the video is so good. Um, uh, whereas someone just starting out actually, and, and who maybe don't have this kind of understanding of, 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 of what makes an audience engaged. And I think to some extent, maybe Gen Z people are more attuned to this than other older generations because they've watched so much content especially short form, that they kind of know what is boring and cringe and what is not a bit more. Um, but um, what I'm getting at is that uh, just starting out being yourself without thinking about YouTube and retention and having none of that to fall back on is probably not a great starting point for most people. Um, although by all means try. I mean, it's lovely when things just work out the gate. I think it's interesting that I think that the real time long length videos are really interesting for that reason of seeing behind the scenes. Like I've seen YouTube channels where it's travel related, but you have these travel vlogs that are highly edited. And I think that would work good 2016, 2017. Um, but nowadays I see these videos that are like four hours long and it's these guys traveling, exploring, uh, those videos, again, are more interesting because it's like we're not seeing this hyper-edited version of that reality. We're actually being there with you and exploring. Um, and there's this great YouTube channel called The Outdoor Boys, if you've seen that. They crush it. They get millions and millions of views. And it's the same thing of like it's very long-length videos. And we get to be with them for an entire day whilst they go fishing and capturing these huge fishes, you know, in Alaska. Um, and, yeah, their channel is great for that. And I think these these types of YouTube channels, um, blow up because they're very unique in that way and a lot of people can't compete um, because of the advantages that they have. The other thing that kind of came to mind when looking through this is is um, figuring out in terms of the content that you're making what the what the different content buckets are but also what the purpose of all of them is are um, because if, for example this you know, the channel we're talking about all of the big outlier ones are these POV head chef at a high-end London restaurant blah 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 and like we've covered, you're watching that because you're you're interested in um, what it is like to exist in a world that you do not occupy for the rest of the time and to get a glimpse of how other people in very specific positions can live, which is cool. But then equally, a lot of the videos on this channel are specific um, how to make the best version of this, how to uh, make the ultimate roast potatoes and blah, blah, blah. And I would argue that like something like that, it's now that I'm in, now that this kind of top of funnel, big, uh, you know, big swing viral videos where we are following a chef around doing doing their thing have got me in, um, I'm now interested enough in like who these guys are to potentially then think, oh, actually, though I didn't care about learning anything specific with those ones, I am interested to know how these guys make the best ever roast potatoes and the best, the best ever deviled eggs or whatever else it is they're doing. And it, whether or not this is deliberate, it, it feels like if you're thinking of your videos in this kind of funnel where um, you know that if somebody had just seen your roast potatoes video off the bat, they might not have watched it. They might not have been in the mood to learn a tutorial type thing. Um, but thinking that once I've got them with this like top of funnel uh, content bucket, what should my next content bucket down be? And can the goals of those videos change? Am I just trying to inspire people or entertain people or whatever with this, you know, this kind of entry point. Uh, and then once they're in my ecosystem, what is it that I'm actually trying to achieve with the other types of videos that I'm making? And maybe this is like, it's obvious, but I think a lot of people go into uh, their YouTube channel without a really clear sense of what their goal is and like what the, what the purpose of each of their content buckets are and what they're trying to achieve with each of those different style of videos. And I think channels like this kind of show you that actually there there can be some intentionality to it and and thinking of it like a funnel is maybe something that's helpful and yeah i think that's also something that will probably help them feel like they're doing something authentic that they enjoy 
that they're not just spamming away with the one thing that worked a while ago, but that they're, you know, adding value, even if those value more value add videos as opposed to voyeuristic videos get maybe like a third of the views. And and I think the, the interesting thing, the the underlying story is that this is an actual restaurant that is taking bookings, that is looking for chefs to come work with them. Um, and I'm assuming that this channel is helping them massively. Um, like if I go next time I'm in London and I want to go to somewhere nice to eat, you know, maybe I would go here just out of curiosity and because I, I feel like I know the people almost. Um, and so, yeah, there's, I think there is a, like a increasingly businesses that have this kind of digital savvy will build up a massive edge. I mean, you can guarantee that the restaurants who do similar things to Fallow, who are in their same area of London, are probably looking at this channel and being like, what the hell? Like, uh, why are we, should we be doing this? What's, they have a right, like a line going around the block to get in. Well, they don't because they take reservations, but you know, um, it's probably something worth thinking about if you run a restaurant or any other, or, or a hairdressers or a, uh, whatever it is, can you make content that will market you well in an organic way? So that's it for this episode of Making It. Um, this was a new concept that we wanted to trial where we would each bring a YouTube channel of our own and discuss it. Um, if you enjoyed this concept, please let us know in the comments if you're on YouTube or send us a tweet if you're listening uh, to the audio version of this uh, because we would love to, to get feedback to understand what is it that you really love about this podcast and the things that you'd like to see more of us from. Um, so if you enjoyed this podcast uh, and you would like to see us do this concept once a month, um, let us know and we'll take that into consideration. Um, but thanks for watching and we'll see you all in the next episode.